We are live and we are ready to thrive. Welcome back, everyone, to Triple Play Fantasy, your home for fantasy analysis, interviews, and entertainment. D-Mendy here back with you guys, joined by a very special guest tonight. We welcome in a woman that packs a punch figuratively with her injury analysis and TV presence. She's ESPN and the People's Injury Analyst, physical therapist, board-certified orthopedic clinical specialist, and certified strength and conditioning specialist. Her accolades are honestly like a novel. Ladies and gentlemen, your friendly neighborhood 49ers fan and winner of bets on the 06010, fellow dog parent, Stefania Bell. How is it going? <laughs> Hello. Yes, we were having a conversation about our dogs before we started. It's like a requirement, you know. My dog well, is like my child, so got to talk about him. He, Rico gets a lot of air time, too. Well, I, I just loved talking about Rico and talking about my dog, Zeke, before we started, just because it's really fun to talk about someone that loves dogs as much as you do. And and you even gave me some tips on some things to help with our dog problems and some things that <laughs> can help with this socialization. So it's a very enriching experience for me. And um, Rico, obviously, sounds like he gets the best treatment over there. He is spoiled. There's no doubt. He is. Uh, I hope that Rico is not going to make a surprise appearance, vocal <laughs> appearance during the show. He is passed out right now on his big dog blanket on the couch um, after running around with his pals at daycare or school, as I call it. But <laughs> <laughs> it's, so hopefully I tired him out for us. Daycare and the dog channel that we were talking about prior mm -hmm. dog TV. So it, it was, it's a ton of great stuff, but Everybody knows, obviously, Stefania Bell, injury analyst, and people have you on the show, on shows, on ESPN all the time, talk about your injury takes on players, and rightfully so, because I think that you're the best out there, and I think many people agree with that, but I don't think enough people respect just your fantasy analysis enough, like the player that you are, because not only were you crushing Scott Fishbowl all last season, you also didn't either you won or you came close to winning the Vampire League for the 06 right? I won, Last the, I won the uh, Guillotine League that we oh, did. The Guillotine yeah, the, League, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. Their Survivor, whatever we, I, I, I don't know. It's called a whole lot of different things, but that's, uh, we started off with it being called the Guillotine League. And so <laughs> that's what, you know, the French, the Francophile in me is, I like that name. And yes, I did win. And it was really fun because every week on the podcast, we would have this dramatic, you know, they'd play taps for whoever, you know, got killed off that week in the in the league. And then we'd go and raid their, um, you know, all their, their roster because that's how it works. You know, when that person's gone, all those players become available. I highly recommend, you know, yeah, I've been playing fantasy for years. And one thing uh, working with Matthew Berry does, he he's played like all these different formats, tried all these things. And He'll tell us like you really need to try this format, and and we a lot of us hadn't played that before, and so we did it as a show. So it was like us, our producers, the show directors. Like it was really fun, and uh, what was really fun was every week that I stayed in and watched all of them get picked off one by one. <laughs> so yeah, that was my that that and the Scott Fishbowl. I mean. What more can you say about the Scott Fishbowl? That's like, yeah. I, I And there's so many people in it, and obviously so many people in the industry, so many fans who are really dedicated fantasy football players that I didn't really want to get my hopes up. I mean, I just assume in a league that big that I'm not going to have a chance of winning. And then I was like, I actually could do this, you know? And I just... Had uh, my my team stayed relatively healthy for the first time since I've been playing, which I think you know that's huge in that league because let's be honest, you know there's no trades and it's really hard to acquire good talent, especially once you get deep into the season. So a lot of people, if they if they have injury woes on their team, and, you know, and two years ago I drafted Saquon Barkley, so you know how that went. Uh, not last year. And last year I, I had a team that stayed fairly healthy. And so I was fortunate enough to go pretty far, but, um, not close enough. Not Do you remember close. some of the players that were on that team? It's terrible, but no, I don't. 
<laughs> I'm sure I'd have to look at my roster. As soon as I saw my roster, I'd be, well, I did. I do think I had Patrick Mahomes because I remember thinking like Patrick Mahomes was a quarterback who, but I had Patrick Mahomes and somebody else as a quarterback. It wasn't Josh Allen, but I might have had Ju Justin Herbert. I had like Oof. another prolific, I had really prolific quarterbacks. And in fact, because Patrick Mahomes, a couple of the weeks, but I had like the top points in our group and it was if both quarterbacks had a really good week. Um, and then, so I think in that league, that is a huge thing is getting two really productive quarterbacks who don't make a lot of mistakes because you mm -hmm. got penalized for interceptions and fumbles. And that's one thing that, um, you know, Mahomes traditionally ha has been pretty clean as a quarterback. So, um, yeah, and I, I, I honestly can't remember everybody else without looking at it. Too many leagues. I, I think it was so. Yeah, it was. It's definitely for those that don't know Scott Fishbowl. It was. It's super flex, and I believe they were also minus for incompletions last year too. Mm -hmm. So it was. Yeah. You had the like super accurate quarterbacks. So mm -hmm. Mahomes and and uh, Justin Herbert. That right there. That's a lethal combination. Oh, I, I think I had Austin Eckler too, because oh, there we go. it was still before people got really wise to him. Now forget it. Like he's going to go, but I think I got him fairly late in the draft considering, cause you know, it's a, we have big groups. I mean, and it's slow draft by email. So, um, you know, it takes a while and you're thinking, Oh, this person is for sure going to get plucked by the time it gets to me. I was just, I lucked out in a lot of ways and had a few good picks, key picks here and there. And like I said, most everyone stayed healthy, which is always, you know, it's, of course, I think that's one of the most important things in fantasy that and being able to make adjustments, just hard to make an adjustment in that particular format because there are no trades and, you know, because of the number of people playing what's available talent is, is not that deep. No. And you're right. I mean, Obviously, there's a lot of people in these leagues, people that that obviously it's not like a home league where you make it some that don't know what they're doing. These are all people that are avid players, listen to pot, great podcasts like the 06010 and and are know how to do their drafts. And so it makes it more difficult. And you stood out. I, I don't remember how many there was in there. Maybe it was like 30,000. Was it? It was a lot of people. Um, oh but you remember. were you were in the top 10 like most of the season. Cause I remember seeing your name and then hearing it on the podcast too. And I was like, go Stefania, like you're crushing it. <laughs> and uh, I think it's really cool. And that's why I, I was really interested in bringing you on today for no injury talk, but just straight, let's talk fantasy football. Cause people need to hear. It always goes back to injury. You know, there's always going to be some, <laughs> let me tell you why some of the people that I don't want, you know, are not as high on and that might be a concern, but I appreciate what you're saying. I appreciate that's fair. it. Uh, so, I thought it'd be cool because I'm not, I don't want to just talk. I like to have a little bit extra, something fun around it. So we're going to play a little game called bell or buzzer. <laughs> and how this is going to work is I'm going to read you a statement. And if you are for it, you're behind it. You're going to say, ring the bell and I'll ring the bell. I got my soundboard hooked up. Oh, or you if do? You are, okay. oh yeah. We're, we're going all out for this one. And uh, if you are against the statement, you could tell me why and I'll, I'll hit the buzzer sound and we can talk about it. But I tried to pick, you know, obviously some 49ers, of course, had to get your take on some of those and just some general hot topic players this offseason. So the first one I have for you is A.J. Brown will be a top seven wide receiver in PPR leagues in 2022. Is that a bell or a buzzer? Oh, that's a buzzer. Oh, that's a buzzer. So, <laughs> sorry. And I like A.J. Brown, but top seven top seven when he's going to an offense where it's not necessarily going to be that he's going to be the focus of attention. You know, it, there are, there would have been more fantasy friendly places for him to go and be a star. But I think in Philly, um, I, I it's almost kind of a lateral move from a fantasy perspective. That's what I think. And uh, you know, in Tennessee, I mean, Look, that it, it's tough to evaluate in the sense that he was there and then alongside Julio Jones recently, who was struggling with his own set of injuries. Um, their offense wasn't a pass heavy offense anyway, because there was so much Derrick Henry involvement. Um, and AJ Brown's a talented receiver, you know, big physical. He's going to be different than what they have in Devontae Smith there, but 
I just don't think, um, you know, and Dallas Goddard is a big pass catcher for them, even though he's not a wide receiver. I think he's going to factor huge into the offense. We've got a quarterback who runs a lot and takes away some of what you could do with a receiver um, just in the way that he moves around the field. So I just, I mean, there's so many good receivers out there. Top seven is really, really high in terms of productivity. I'm curious why, what made you go with seven? Like, do <laughs> so, you have him at like eight in your? <laughs> I have him at seven. So that's. Oh, you uh, have him at seven. Oh, okay. So I, that's why it's the weird number. Uh, and so this is kind of my reasoning on it is, you know, he's coming off 63 catches, 869 yards, five touchdowns, 13 games last season. So obviously not a great year, but he's had a thousand or more yards in each of his first two seasons before that. And he's going to Jalen Hurts now, who the rapport is great to say the least. I think he was at, or Jalen Hurts was at AJ Brown's kid's birthday party before the trade even happens. <laughs> so I think always a test is <laughs> like, you know, their social media relationship yep. and how much do they hang out? It's the Cooper Cup thing now, right? Like they have breakfast together all the time. Mm -hmm. Now they're going to kids' birthdays parties together. So he's already one of the most targeted wide receivers in the NFL. And with the contract extension he got and the amount that he's, I guess the expectations that he's bringing to Philly, he's going to be one of the most targeted wide receivers in the league next year. So I think those targets eventually will lead to him having more volume, to him being more fantasy relevant, assuming he doesn't get hurt. Obviously, Jalen Hurts has an offense with Devontae Smith. That's a big Smith. assumption because he missed four games, part of a fifth last year because of injuries, yeah. like the knee problems the year before. Um, I think he's tough. It's not a knock on that at all. It's just I don't know if he can stay on the field the full time. That's a lot to ask. That's a very good point. I, I'm hoping maybe in 17 games you could get like 14 or 15 games out of him. That would, I guess, be the optimistic hope there. Mm -hmm. Um but, I mean, if you look at sure. it, the passing attack last year, 29.8 attempts per game, which was the fourth lowest in the league, and they had the fewest per game at home. So, you obviously, they have to change their offensive philosophy for this to happen. I do think they change it. So, <laughs> well, I hope so, at least. <laughs> just say, I just, a part of it, too, is, to, is, is managing the quarterback. And yes. because if the quarterback takes off running, um, and he can certainly throw the ball. Like, we've seen that. We've seen that he can. But, man, Devontae Smith? Do you think AJ Brown's going to earn the? I, I think it depends what the, how they run their offense, really. Yeah. You know, that's a very good point. Yeah, AJ Brown could be a volume guy, and if that ends up being the case, then then I think you know, and certainly if they get in close to the goal line, you know, or in the red zone, I think he's probably one of their best targets there. Yes. Um, so that you can get your fantasy points probably in with touchdowns, but uh, I, I just don't know. I'm I'm. A little skeptical on their overall offense, so we shall see. Yeah, but, it'll be interesting to see that new look Eagles offense come play next year. I think that's the for me the biggest thing about this season coming in. It feels like it's far away, but yet not far away because here we are. You know, the draft settled down, and we're doing a, like a dynasty league that I have right now. We're doing our our <laughs> dynasty draft, and so we're, I'm in the middle of drafting right now for something, and so it's not that far off. But this is I've never seen movement like this in the off season. We yeah, haven't we're in an awkward seen the NFL middle do this. Time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're kind of like in an awkward middle time right now. Like, yeah, but I mean, draft. like, there's so much new identity to everything mm -hmm. because there's been personnel changes as far as coaches and coordinators. So, you, you know, when you're trying to gauge the personality of an offense, it's hard to just, you, you, it's not as much carryover consistency, I think, one year to the next because you have a lot of, a changing parts. You have players who've moved and you have personnel, coaching personnel who've moved. And I think that's going to make this one of the most challenging years in terms of trying to make fantasy projections based on all that. Cause you can't look strictly at past performance because everything's um, moving around. Yeah, no, I agree. And it's probably been the craziest off season we've ever seen in general. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you this though, your 49ers, I don't know if it, I mean, there's craziness in the change of quarterback, but I'm more concerned in this question with the run game. And my question to you is Elijah Mitchell will lead the 49ers in rushing yards in 2022. Is that a bell or a buzzer? That is a bell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. You have the ding. It's just like the podcast. Perfect. Uh, perfect. Yeah. I mean, 
he's he's clearly the anointed one when it comes to the, their lead back. And, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of jokes about Debo being, you know, the wide back and, and we don't even know what's going to totally happen with him. But I, I do believe Debo stays there. I do think that that's going to work out. I think that will end up blowing over and he'll no, I, no matter what happens, he's not going to be, even if there's less utilization of Debo out of the backfield, it's not going away. Um, but Elijah Mitchell, if he can stay healthy, which is the big caveat, right? Because he missed some time due to injury. And, uh, you know, it was sort of a punishing rookie season for him. And, but he jumped in really quickly. They love him. They love his versatility. They love his vision. Um, do you remember even that they drafted Trey Sermon in the same year? Probably not because he was not even heard from barely throughout the season. And I don't see any reason why that would change. Elijah Mitchell is the guy. So do you think there's anything to say with the fact that it's been now four straight years of a new rusher for the team going back to Matt Breida, 2018, Raheem Mostert, 2019, Jeff Wilson Jr., 2020, and then Elijah Mitchell, 2021? Yeah, I think they found their guy, you know, and I think that was clear because they moved, Mostert went to Miami, um, followed Mike McDaniel there. And, you know, Brita was gone long before that and has since moved on. And, you know, I think I think Elijah Mitchell is the clear number one. Jeff Hasey still has a role. Um, and we'll see what happens with Mostert, you know. I mean, not Mostert, excuse me, uh, Trey Sermon. But – I don't know that he's even definitely on the roster when camp opens. I mean, really, he didn't do anything last year. And they clearly, they it was like they made a decision. Like, okay, this is not, maybe, maybe sometimes the players, you know, you scout, you, you think things are going to work out well, and they don't. And uh, for whatever reason, the 49ers have done a good job of finding value in like the middle to late rounds and running backs as sort of what they've done. Mm -hmm. And I think this time they re it really panned out well and they like Elijah Mitchell and he's young. So there's no reason to move on from him. I was curious also your thoughts since they drafted Tyrion Davis price this year in the third round. And I read an I article. Yeah. You think it's for oh. depth. This was, but, um, go ahead. I was, this was an article go. from, um, Niners nation and they said that they, this person said that they're concerned that Elijah Mitchell can hold up for a full season. And they think he's more of a complimentary back to what they're hoping Tyrion, uh, Tyrion Davis price would be. They kind of have like a one, two punch with them too. Do you think that's not the case? Um, I, I don't think it's the case this year. I mean, Elijah Mitchell, like you, I think Elijah Mitchell, that was lucky what they mm -hmm. got from him because they weren't expecting him to do as much as he did, but he certainly impressed them at camp. But when I went out to training camp last year, there were a lot of whispers about Elijah Mitchell and you knew they were going to find a way to utilize him. But at the time th we didn't have the inclination that Trey Sermon, at least in the early part of camp, which is when I was there, that he was going to sort of fall off the map with them. Um, I think it's always a concern. That's a concern about any running back in general. I mean, unless you're Derek Henry and even he had a, injury last year that cost him a huge chunk of time but uh, it's a vulnerable position the most vulnerable when it comes to injury and we know that the Niners in particular have been compromised by multiple injuries to their offensive starters for the last few years and last year wasn't as bad as the year before but still they they see what happens and they need uh, several people who can operate within that offense. So it, it doesn't surprise me that they would, I, I don't know why they felt the need to move up to the third round. So, you know, maybe they're in that analysis. It's a justification move um, for them, but I don't see somebody overtaking Elijah. I think he is the lead rusher barring injury and they're, everybody else is there to help out. That makes sense to me. I'm definitely hoping just for our clarity's sake. That's one of the backfields that are I'm kind of scared of right now for fantasy football. But oh, I would feel it's a lot terrible better. for fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a Niners fan, so uh, I think for from that perspective, is it's great because you know 
I always want us to have depth and insurance and complimentary um, chess pieces, you know, things of, and, and who better to engineer that than Kyle Shanahan. Um, but uh, I would not, I, I, I'm not seeking to get Elijah Mitchell unless he falls to like, you know, if he's like a third back for me, sure. But he, he won't last that long, mm -hmm. but that's where I would be comfortable taking him because um, you, you just, you can't be sure in terms of the offense that they run because they are mindful too, that high utilization increases the injury risk. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, look, if I'm going to listen to anybody's opinion, it's going to be someone that's as big a fan of the 49ers. Than you. So I'll, I <laughs> well, it's definitely not like won't. they run their offensive plan by me. So I could be totally <laughs> wrong, but uh, this is, the, these are things that I, I do talk to a lot of folks who, who spend time out there, including a plug for Nick Wagner, our, um, NFL nation reporter who covers the 49ers does a great job. So uh, he probably can't stand how much I ping him about stuff and <laughs> ask him questions because I'll have a sense on something, but he's out there and he's working with, he's, you know, seeing the team practicing every day and, and hearing things in the building. Um, but you can consider my opinions informed by some of the people who cover the team. Yes. <laughs> I love it. Well, we were talking about last year's rookie and Elijah Mitchell. Let's talk about a rookie this year and Sky Moore and Stefan. I'm a big Chiefs fan. I was <laughs> reaching for the sky when we drafted him in the second round. Yes, and the were. statement for you would be, <laughs> is he's going to be the number one wide receiver in fantasy points for the Chiefs in 2022. Oh, for the Chiefs. Yes. You didn't say that when you were thrown. Oh, did I not? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> No, absolutely. Like, <laughs> so I thought it was just the number one wide receiver That's for the bad. Chiefs. Um, yes, I, I, I could see that potentially for the Chiefs. Um, I, it's going to be weird, right? I don't know. There's another one. Like, look at all the changes, right? You got Juju mm -hmm. there. You got Marquez Valdez Scantling. You've got uh, Miko Hardman, and I don't know. I feel like I never really know what Miko Hardman is going to do right you know and, mm -hmm. and he's in some games he factors in quite a bit and others like you, you don't hear his name called at all um and then sky Moore, and so how do how does how do they divvy that up and by the way travis kelsey is still playing football you know mm -hmm. still catching yeah. pat and and the problem for me is that looking at the wide receiver group I don't think any of them are as valuable as Kelsey still because he still he is by far going to be the most trusted outlet for Mahomes at this point. Don't you think? Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. Anytime he needs to make a throw, he's looking for Kelsey. Right. And Kelsey is a big factor in the red zone. So that hurts your receiver group. Um, but. I do think that Sky Moore, you know, this is they're they're looking to build on something they lost when when they lost Tyree Hill. So I, I think that's a possibility as far as your wide receivers, but not necessarily of your pass catchers. I still think Travis Kelsey is your most productive pass catcher there. A hundred percent. I think Kelsey will be the best option in terms of just overall pass catcher on this team. But as far as wide receivers go, I'm a little intrigued with Sky Moore because you obviously have MBS, who's going to be a, a big vertical threat for this team. Uh, but Juju, I think he's on a one-year contract. And I'm sure he'll be – I picture him more kind of like a Sammy Watkins for this team rather than the, a de facto, this is the guy I'm throwing to at in the receiver role that I need to get the ball to on like third and 12 and Kelsey's double covered. And what's intriguing to me about Sky Moore is he's someone who is regarded as one of the best slot receivers in this draft. Mm -hmm. Six drops in three years in college. They uh they said he broke 26 tackles last year, according to PFF, one of the best among all wide receivers. Um, his 10-yard split is a 1.46 seconds, which is the 99th percentile. So that shows he has immediate quick a quickness and burst off the line of scrimmage in that short area. So I think he's going to be someone Mahomes looks to early and often. You know, gets that quick slant to him as he's coming across the middle to get 15 yards. I was just going to say, he's a good across-the-middle guy, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, he 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 could be a good he can be a good assist to Kelsey in the yes you know, in that middle safe zone for you know kind of the safe safety zone for Patrick Mahomes if he gets into trouble that's who he can look for and we'll see how he adapts to the NFL I mean I actually really like 
the possibilities for him. You know, I, I like what the role could be. It's again, it's just really hard to imagine how this all looks because we've had ideas before of how other receivers would look in the Kansas City offense, and it has not come to pass. That's you know, true. ask it, Nicole Hardman about that. Oh my goodness! <laughs> oh, his name is just like horrible for Chiefs fans to hear now. It's it's just. I uh, feel I don't know why. I mean, is that he he's got some talent. You he know? does. Uh, he's, I mean, he's dropped so many balls. One of the yeah. things I remember distinctly is but him running and he's running like, you know, even Mahomes kind of calling him out for running the wrong routes or not cutting in enough on he's doing like an out route and he's letting someone slip under him. Uh, there's just been so many things over the years and it's, and this is kind of it for him at this point. If he doesn't do anything this year, I think he's gone. So we'll, we'll find out. I think there's a player to watch um, on your Chiefs is Justin uh, Ross. And that, oh, yes. Yeah. You know, I think um, to me, he'll be the most interesting story of the draft if he stays on, makes the roster. And you think he'll be able to overcome the scary injury that he had? I think it was his spine, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He had a spinal surgery. So not everybody was willing to take him, but he already played. I mean, that's the thing. If he hadn't played before, but he played at Clemson, he ended up with a foot injury, and that is why he didn't, you know, he, he struggled in the season that he came back. And I think people were like, oh, he wasn't the same. And I'm like, well, you know, after you had a major spine surgery, I wouldn't necessarily expect you to be the same right out of the gate. Even guys coming off a knee surgery sometimes take another year till they look exactly like they were before. Do they? Do, but he looked good enough to make you think that that talent that he had, which is what you saw when Clemson won the national title, that he could be that guy again. And if he isn't, then they got a steal in the draft. And, uh, you know, he's super talented. I, I would like to see him stick with the Chiefs. You're hoping. <laughs> You're hoping. You, his highlights just make you fall in love with the player when you watch what he did at Clemson. It's insane. Uh, but I want to go back to your Niners. And specifically, a very hot topic this offseason, Jimmy Garoppolo is still on the team. He is. And which is <laughs> weird to think at this point. So, my question to you Trey Lance will start 17 games for the Niners in 2022. Is that a bell or a buzzer? <laughs> it's a buzzer, but not because, I mean, not, because, not because he's not the starter. I think Trey Lance is a starter. They want to see what they've got in him. Jimmy being there is a confluence of variables that that resulted in him not being moved right now, including the fact that he injured his shoulder. It was so late because the 49ers went so far. And, of course, they can't forget that they went so far um, while he was quarterback of the team. And he not only tore the ligament in his thumb, which ultimately the way that he tore it because he took a little piece off the bone, they, it can heal on its own. It just needs time to heal. But he didn't have time for it to heal while he was still trying to play, and he fell trying to protect his hand. He hurt his shoulder, and he hurt it pretty significantly. I actually think if people knew how bad his shoulder injury was, they would have given him a lot more credit for how he performed down the stretch. But be that as it may, he ended up getting his shoulder repaired. Most teams that would have an interest and some teams that did express an interest, one of the things that made them hold off from committing is they weren't going to get him throwing soon enough. So if they brought in, if they brought him in to be a, their quarterback, let's say it's a team that, you know, wants him as a bridge or whatever, he was not going to be able to throw until August. So teams don't want, you know, it's kind of like you want to, you know, try something on before you buy it. It's like, I think they wanted to see that he was throwing and that he looked good throwing before they committed to it. Now, what's going to happen is, you know, he's doing his rehab and he's doing great. I am told. And he starts throwing and you know how it goes. There'll be injuries in the preseason and maybe somebody will come up with an offer that's good enough to make a move for the 49ers. But at the very least, I mean, if they don't end up making that move, they have the insurance of Jimmy Garoppolo there. Um, I don't think that's ideal for them. I, I think that the most likely scenario is that he gets moved later. 
Yeah, because I would think that for Trey Lance, you would start feeling pressure if he's still there. And you've seen when he's healthy and capable, he's he wins games for them. And so if he starts not performing, they start out like one and three or something like that, and he would still be there. I that's got to be a tough place for Trey Lance to be in. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that they care. It's kind of like that's the job is perform or else, you know, like we've given you the keys to the car. So now you have to go out and drive it. I, I just think that um, anybody saying I, you're, you're probably going to win your bet. If you say player is not going to start 17 games because <laughs> hardly anybody makes it through the season and starts every single game, including the quarterbacks. I mean, they end up with something here or there that knocks them out for a game or so. So that was the only reason I really, Um, hit the buzzer on that one. I actually think that Trey Lance will be the starter. He will be the starter from week one. And that's, that's going to be their plan going forward. Yeah. And very excited to watch him play hopefully a full season this year, 15 or more fantasy points in three of the six games he played in two twenty 20 or more. And he also had 31 or more yards on seven carries in two of those games as well. So he very much a lot of fantasy production can be there from him. I just think people need to be patient because you got to remember this guy hasn't played very many games in the last two years. You know, (laughs) he's barely played at all. And he got a little taste of it in the NFL and he did get dinged up a bit just in the short time that he played last year. So um, I'm not expecting miracles, but you would like to see growth as he develops into the position. And that's what I think they're expecting. A wise person once said, trust the process. And that's what we're going to be doing with uh, (laughs) Trey Lance this year here. Next person on this list is somebody that I'm, I see tweeted about all the time on fantasy football, Twitter, Deandre Hopkins and Mm -hmm. people saying some people are not touching him this year in redraft. Other people say, I'll take the dip. Uh, But my question to you is Deandre Hopkins will not finish inside the top 35 wide receivers in 2022. And keep in mind, he was wide receiver 46 last year, missing seven games in PPR. So is that a bell or buzzer? Yeah, that's a buzzer. Because I think he's going to finish. I mean, it's interesting. If you look at our consensus ranks for where we have him in the preseason, and these are done knowing that he's going to start, you know, I think by all the games missed, you're referencing the fact that he's suspended to start the season. Mm -hmm. So you know he's going to be out six games. And he's at 39. And you just by default, we're going to lose a handful of receivers to injury before the year is mm-hmm. over. So that automatic, if just assuming he just was like met expectations there, he would cross into the top 35. But I think DeAndre Hopkins, you no, know, he, he is a chip on his shoulder kind of guy. You know, when he got out of Houston, he really wanted to prove that he had made a good move to Arizona. He and Kyler Murray clicked right away. Um, it I know that I am the one who always says, you know, the biggest predictor of future injury is past injury. And so you cannot discount completely what happened with him. You know, he had a hamstring injury. That was a problem. He had an MCL injury at the end that needed surgery as soon as their season ended. He, uh, that's not normal for him. He gets banged up a lot because of the way that he plays. He's a very, you know, he will, he's wins the contested catches. He is not afraid to go up and get it. Um, but he, every year until this, I mean, he only had two seasons, I think in his entire career where he didn't play all 16 games. And in those two years, he played 15 out of 16. So this, this year was an aberration. Yes. It happens to be the most recent one. He's getting older, but uh, I'm sure that he hears all the chirping and between that and the suspension, I would trust him to come back fired up and ready to perform. And they, you know, Arizona is so, they're another one that's so hard to read for me offensively. Like I really don't get everything that they're doing there. Um, You know, there was the Kyler Murray and the organization. Like, I just don't know. It's like, you want to see it all come together, but there, I don't really know how it's going to look when they start out. Now they got, Zach Ertz back. And I think that was good. I think he was a good fit for them. Um, so, you know, they've got their tight end, but <clears throat> after DeAndre Hopkins, we didn't really, you know, the receiver 
the receiver group was sort of questionable in terms of who was going to be the next big pass catcher there, right? It never, yeah. you know, at the start of the season last year, I think, you know, I think people were all over the place and who they kind of picked as it was going to be the number two. And I don't think anybody was right. You know, they're so like you said, they're so hard to figure out and bringing in Hollywood Brown <laughs> in there now, AJ Green's still there. And, uh, you know, Zach Ertz, Trey McBride, the top tight end in this draft, this past draft is going to be there, probably get some red zone looks, I'm sure. James Conner will get a lot of carries. James Conner will have to, I mean, the thing about that is, you know, and he'll, he'll catch some passes here and there, but he, uh, I just don't know workload wise, why, like, I, I think they're asking a lot of him, of mm -hmm. someone who will struggle if he is, if he is leaned on too heavily in terms of the workload. That's what I would say. Um, Hollywood Brown, I was, I, I knew there was somebody I was forgetting when I was thinking about their additions. Um, and then they got rid of Christian Kirk, who made a <laughs> business decision that was quite easy for him, you know, in terms of where he went. He set um, fire to the rest of the NFL with that. I know, it really did. That's actually what got us in this state that we're in. Of, yeah. And everybody, I mean, the rest of the NFL, everybody, like you could just see them like banging their head into the wall. Like this is like started this high demand for wide receivers in terms of what they expect to get paid. Um, wide receivers not named Devonte Adams, by the way. But I, I, you know, it's interesting. I still think DeAndre Hopkins, that's going to be Kyler Murray's main look. He always was. When, when, since those two been playing together, that was his reliable guy. And I think that's still the case. AJ Green's had his career resurrected by getting out of Cincinnati. More power to him, but you know he's not going to—he's not going to be the number one in that offense. And um, it'll be interesting to me to see what Hollywood Brown does. It, a deep perimeter threat, yes, but I just don't—I don't know what Arizona's offense is going to look like. I'll be interested to see it too because I think I forget um, Brandon Marshall's podcast, but he had uh, Hollywood Brown on there and he said, did you request a trade? And he said, yes. And then he said, why? And he said, I, I love Lamar, but they have a formula there. They run the ball. They play good defense. He said, I wanted a chance to be able to show what I could do. And I couldn't do that in Baltimore. So I'm wondering if Arizona trading a first round pick for him, make sure that he's featured early and often with the, uh, the trust in him that they're putting with that draft capital. So uh, I'll be interested to see when they're both on the field, Hopkins and him together. Cause... Yeah, and he and Kyler Murray have a relationship, so mm -hmm. you know that that definitely helps. Um, that definitely helps, um, and and you're right because they're going to have a chance to really show that when they don't have DeAndre Hopkins. But it wasn't the timing. I I mean everything's all blur to me now, but I feel like the timing of that going down, they knew somehow they were, you know. Well, he was at the uh, Arizona draft party, I think, wasn't he? Yeah, that's right. You know, so they, <laughs> that's right. But it, didn't he say he, he didn't tell he knew, but he didn't tell Kyler or something? I, I, I guess they kept it like under wraps. And I think yeah, Lamar, like Lamar said something like, I thought it could happen, but they didn't say it did happen. Yeah. Or something like that. It was, it was very, it's all sort of strange. I mean, it really was a blur because once, things started happening and everybody was moving around. I couldn't keep track because when, you know, all these guys were moving all over the place. So uh, I, I, it was, it was strange. And then the timing of Deandre Hopkins going out for six weeks and they knew that now that they've lost him for a while. Um, but I don't know that I, I just, you had a very upset, like think about what Arizona to me, it's like, think about what happened to them. Think about their first half of the season and think about their second half. I think it's two straight years, if I'm not mistaken, too, that they collapsed. Yeah, but they, in both years they've fallen apart. But last year was, I think, more dramatic because they were unbeatable, mm -hmm. essentially, for the first half of the year. And the second half of the year, they couldn't win. Uh, nothing was working. There was a lot of frustration. And granted, they were without DeAndre Hopkins, but they're going to be without him again for the first six weeks. And it better look better than it did near the end, you know? Yeah, I mean hopefully it's a new story for them this year because they're a fun team to watch and it's definitely 
in weird and interesting to see how they've collapsed in different ways over the last two years, but they've got the best offensive team they've had in long time, probably since the Anquan Bolden, Larry Fitzgerald days. So hopefully they'll produce. Um, but I'll tell you a team that is going to produce this year, the Miami Dolphins, the, all the additions that they've brought into this team. And if you look in the backfield, there is a lot of new blood there. You got Raheem Mostert, Chase Edmonds, Sony Michelle, and then of course, Miles Gaskin is still there. He's fourth on the depth chart as it stands today, according to the ESPN depth chart. Stefania, Salman Ahmed is still there. It, he, <laughs> my goodness, what a backfield. Uh, Stefania, is this a bell or buzzer that none of the Miami Dolphins running backs are you're going to feel comfortable in like a 10 or 12 team lead starting week to week outside of injury happening? Yeah, that's a bell. I mean, you're totally right on that. It's uh, We were talking about the 49ers and how – it's going to be cloudy. This is even worse. You know, this is really, it's going to be a mess in terms of fantasy. I will be excited to watch what my, like the dolphins are one of my favorite teams to watch this year. Um, I, sorry to see Mike McDaniel leave the 49ers, but I'm really excited to see what he's going to do with the dolphins. And I think I have been sort of a Tua apologist. I think he never got the credit he deserved coming off the injury that he had, which was so much more massive than what I think most people think it was. Um, I mean, if that doesn't heal right, he doesn't walk right ever again, mm -hmm. much less return to playing in the NFL. And no matter what people say, there's an adjustment to that. And the year he was trying to, you know, come, that was the first COVID year. And so nothing was normal and you weren't getting, it, it was just, it was a mess. It was a mess. And then, you know, I think that last year was him really getting his feet wet again as a quarterback, but um, you know, they, they obviously had some troubles, let's just say in, in executing their offense. And they had some players who were inconsistent and consistently unavailable. Like they brought in Will Fuller and, that didn't ever work out. You know, Devontae Parker ends up being hurt a lot late in the year. Um, the running back, you never really felt like they had a, that they had a solid handle on their running back situation. Uh, we saw some rotation there last year as it was, but now they've brought, you know, Raheem Mostert, I would say people shouldn't count on too much because he had a big cartilage procedure and, you know, you're not going to beat a guy up um, in a first season coming off what he had. And I hope for his sake, he can get back to what he was. He was really fun to watch in San Francisco, but volume of work is going to be limited with him. And I don't know if it's just that uh, McDaniel wants to be able to do sort of plug and play with his running backs, kind of like they have done in San Francisco, or he also has just learned that you need multiple backs to basically have enough depth to keep people healthy enough to run the type of offense they want to run. And yeah. that makes it useless for fantasy. I could, I was just visioning in my head right now, like Raheem Mostert, 12 carries for 50 yards. And then Chase Edmonds, like five carries for 19 yards and three catches for 18 <laughs> yards. And then Sony Michelle, two carries for five yards. I could just, it's just like popping in my head and just being like, or right. whoever scores. And who gets the who gets the touchdown? Like if they're in the red right. zone, who's it going to? There's no way to know with the group that they have. Yeah, and, and so I think you're you're spot on with that. So I, I I completely agree with you. It's you know a lot of great players, but good for the team, not good for fantasy. Um, I'm gonna skip number seven because I'm already way over the time. I promised. Oh, I would yeah, keep it's my before. fault. I'm the one who's been talking all the time. But no, no, I don't want you to skip seven because I like that one. Okay, well, um, and but I'll just I'll just say it quickly. I do not think that uh, Tony Pollard gets more touches than Zeke. Oh, the Tony Pollard <laughs> truthers out there are going to be so upset. I know, I know. It's going to oh, be, well. it's, and it's another year. They don't have to believe me. It's okay. We can debate <laughs> this, but uh, no. Zeke yeah, I, had I think two hundred and thirty-seven carries last year. Pollard had a hundred and thirty. They're a little bit closer on the receptions. Um, yeah. It's always I, like just, don't, just remember, Zeke gets the carries inside the red zone. That's going to keep happening. 
Yeah, I think you're right. It's always, I think people go to Tony Pollard, they'll see the better yards per carry, more receiving yards. It, lo- it looked better last year. He looked yeah. better. He was better. Last yeah, and the snaps were, I think, the closest they'd ever been. It was a 45 to 23 edge per game. And mm-hmm. uh, Pollard averaging eight more fantasy points per 100 snaps than Elliott. And I think the big thing people look at is the explosive runs is you have Ezekiel Elliott, 14.7% of his runs are explosive, which is, you know, considered 10 or more yards. And then for Tony Pollard, 31%. So <laughs> more than double that. So that's another kind of, I think people like to point to, and they're like, he's the guy you should be having there. But I'm with you. I think this doesn't happen this year. It's not happening this year. And also if Tony Pollard got the work, would he start to look less like the guy that they're excited about seeing? Because (laughs) part of that is not being overutilized and being younger for sure. And Zeke having a torn PCL and trying to play through that. And that once you have that injury, no matter what they said during the season, you're not going to be a hundred percent yourself. So we shall see. Um, I don't know if you heard about him, like hitting the 22 miles per hour on the GPS and the, I uh, did, yeah. you know, that's great. There's no pads and nothing. It doesn't mean anything really, but I think it's just like, you know, he's hungry. We'll see if it, if it's not there this year, then I'll concede. But I, I, I just don't think they're, and he costs too much. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, I think more than anything, they have that much investment in him. Yeah. Uh, money talks for sure. So last one here, last Niners question, George Kittle will not be a top five fantasy tight end this season. Stefan, is that a bell or buzzer? Oh gosh. I couldn't <laughs> answer this one because it was too, it's too painful. Um, because I think that it's a bell. And it's just because he's too valuable doing all the other things that George Kittle does like block and he's terrific at it, you know, and I think he's going to have moments. He's going to have some games where he is electric in terms of offensive points production. He'll, you know, and, and we saw him in Trey Lance. I think when Trey Lance played, didn't George Kittle score a touchdown in the game that Trey Lance started? I think, I think he did. Um, so you're going to have games like that, but it's not going to be every single time. And I think it's going to be different depending on the opponent, uh, depending on the week. And, you know, George Kittle plays at 150% and sacrifices his body constantly. And that's part of the problem too. Um, he, he's been, you know, he's had to miss some time with injuries and, uh, yeah, I just their tight end has gotten really interesting. Um, there's just the position has developed so much, right? There's so many at the really good athletes now who play the position. And in some offenses, they're really relying on the tight end. They're gonna be a threat in the end zone all the time. You know the teams and you're you're thinking, well, you know, your chiefs are kind of set the bar for that. But I think Irv Smith that everybody forgot about at the Vikings because he missed all of last year. I think he's going to come back and have the role that they thought he was going to have last year. Um, And I think there's going to, I think there's going to be, you know, Kyle Pitts, I think is going to be another one who, as they get that offense in Atlanta together, hopefully um, I think he's going to end up being super productive. I just think that with, more and more of these pass catching tight ends and the way the 49ers use Kittle, it's not going to be conducive to him ending up in the top five. And it hurts my heart to say that. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I think I'm with you hundred percent with that. Cause we look at if Trey Lance starts, you know, you would imagine there's gonna be more QB runs, which means he's probably gonna be blocking for him. Probably a lot more just runs in general, just because they're going to want him to probably bring him along slowly. I'm sure at the beginning of the year, let him get more comfortable and then let him maybe start throwing the ball more. And then to your point as well, like all these young up and coming tight ends too. I mean, you got the air fryer, Pat Fryer move. You got, you know, Dawson Knox air came fryer. on last year. Is that, is that <laughs> official? His nickname, the air fryer. Oh, that's what I call him. I know oh. there's other nicknames out there. <laughs> um, but I mean, there's, there's so many good tight ends that have kind of started bursting on the scene. So I, I I mean, it's it's hard to be a top five tight end if you're not every single week at least doing, you know, getting touchdowns or doing something. So, um, 
it, it's just very interesting. So I, I think I'm with you. I, I think I have him as tight end six. So it's pretty much right there. But yeah, I think it's close. I think it's close. But I let's put it this way: I wouldn't be surprised if he he could be. And you know, let's not forget Mark Andrews, who's mm-hmm. I, I was calling him elite before. Now Matthew feels like he's discovered him on our podcast. I'm like. <laughs> I had Mark Andrews in our war room league, like his second year. And I was just bragging about him all the time. And he like carried my team if I hadn't had a bunch of other injuries, but um, I feel like I want uh, Travis Kelsey, Mark Andrews, Kyle Pitts as the, they're there to me, like at the, at the top, top, you know, yeah. I think it's because you said Kyle Pitts, Mark Andrews, Travis Kelsey, and, um, who was the fourth one I was forgetting? There was like a big four. And then that's when I think Kittle is kind of like that potential fifth one. If, if everything goes right. I mean, there's also Dalton Schultz last year too. Who? who yeah. Was. I, but he's not what I'm trying to think of who, who's the fourth. I feel like it's always Mark Andrews, Kelsey, Kyle Pitts. Because it was for me, those four and George Kittle was one okay. of them. And okay. I just feel like there's a drop. I mean, I, your four could be different, but for me, there's kind of a drop after those three. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, certainly you've got TJ Hawkinson and Noah Fant who have the potential, but Noah Fant, like, I don't even know what's going to happen in Seattle. Darren Waller was the other one. Oh, Waller. Yes. That was what I was. How could I forget Darren Waller? (laughs) Yes, you're right. That, that he, he would be in that four. And so it kind of leaves the, the fifth, the five spot open. Yeah. But I think, like I said, there's, there's other guys who could end up, they, they could end up being that depending on what their offense looks like. And it could push George Kittle out. I mean, Mike Kosicki could have a great year. Who knows? You know, they tagged him. They want him there. I know I mean. they want, I don't think he loved that, but look, <laughs> it could, he could end up being a real scoring threat this year because there's going to be, everybody's going to have to pay attention to this other guy who Mm -hmm. runs really fast down the field, you know? It's going to be fun to watch. I can't believe uh, it's still only May. We have a few more months before (sighs) things start getting really serious, but I'll tell you what's to find it. Talking with with you for almost the last hour has just been an (laughs) absolute blast for me. Uh, You know, it was hard to top the protein bar episode last time, (laughs) but I feel like this was just as good. And I I can't thank you so much for joining me. Thank thank you so much for joining me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me and getting me talking about football. It's hard sometimes to put the thoughts together. It's like, how could I leave out Darren (laughs) Waller? That's how you know it's May. (laughs) I did too. So it's sort of half, you know, we're not talking football every single day because the the wheels, the gears are grinding a little bit slower. But yeah, it's, it's fun to think about and just... There, there's a lot of work that's going to ha- I feel like training camp this year need to go see. I'm going to make a case for trying to see about half the teams in the league because there's just so much that's changing that I got to reacquaint myself with all of them. I love when you go to training camps and you bring it on the show because you get so much good inside information, just hearing <laughs> stuff from the teams. And it's cool because, you know, you kind of get hearing that stuff first and kind of get to bring it to everybody. So it's it's definitely really cool. I'm sure. How many years have you done that where you got to go to all the different camps? Um, I mean, gosh, I've been, I've been at ESPN 14 years now and I've been going to camps, you know, started pretty soon after I got here, just going to one or two, but this year there's injury concerns and changes of offense in so many places that, uh, it's going to be hard to pick. Let's put it that way. Cause there's so <laughs> many places to go, you know? Well, it's going to be fantastic to hear when you report back from all those places. And uh, before we get out of here, I, I do want to give you a chance. Is there anything you would like to plug to our audience of anything you're working on or anything you would like to promote? Well, um, you know, it's funny because right now it's one of those like I did something for NBA Today the other day and I'm working on something with hockey. I'm working on something with UFC. So it's like I'm all over the place, but nothing that I can point uh, your audience to right at the moment, except, of course, Fantasy Focus Football Podcast, which we are back in the studio now um, on Mondays. I did not do today's show because we had Mike Clay talking all his dynasty rankings, which is just excellent. The guy is he, he's phenomenal. I don't know if he the, he uses the computer or the computer uses him. Um, <laughs> It's really all the great work that he's done to compile his rankings, his dynasty rankings for people who are interested. Um, That's what today's was. But 
I'll be back. We'll be in the studio on Mondays and we're doing once a week from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern. So it does include video. So people who want to watch us on YouTube or live on Twitter um, or and that they, you can do that 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern on Mondays or you can listen to the audio version of the podcast once we post it, which is right after the show ends. I love that you guys do that because doing video and being able to interact while you guys go on, I think it's such a cool thing to do and not enough shows do that. And uh, it's really cool that you guys make the effort and the time to do that. And you guys have a great crew over there. Um, oh, well, so. thank you. We like to think so. We have a lot of fun. It really is. Um, we're very lucky to have the group that we do. Yeah. And again, Last thing I'll say, you can tell a lot with how people kind of act on air with one another. You can kind of see the relationship they have like outside of that, just the way they talk. And you guys do a great job of that. I can tell you guys talk about things outside the podcast you guys do together and just the way you guys make fun of each other. That's the way it should be. And uh, it's, no, it's great for everybody that. here. Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, but Stefania, thank you again. Everybody that tune into Triple Play. We always appreciate you guys, whether you watch the YouTube channel, listen to the podcast. It's always appreciated. If you enjoy Stefania Bell, please make sure you like the video, subscribe. All that stuff truly helps us so, so much. And uh, until the next one, guys, we're going to make like a bread truck and we're going to haul these buns. Catch you guys <laughs> in the next one.